Paul, you mentioned in the discussion of the technology that it's important not to understate the obvious objections or limitations to that technology. T to what extent would you extend that concept to other risks of the business? Is it important to include risk factors, if not per se risk factors, but a, a discussion of the risks of the business generally in the, in the Well, yeah, I mean, I think in general, you don't want to, you're going to, so how you're going to go to market, for example, in the plan. But if you're going into a market right now and, and the market is a regulatory controlled market with a monopoly provider, um, say telecom services 25 years ago, you better include in there the obvious question of how are you going to get by AT&T to address the, oh, oh yeah, well don't worry, we're not after the U.S. market. We're going after this market. So I think it's important any area where there's a really obvious kind of killer objection, you know, go ahead and address that quickly. At least earmark it in the plan right there to say we've got an answer to that. And in some cases, um, tell them what the answer is up front. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm not really sure how to ask it. I, it, it has partly to do with, you know, when when is the right time to write a business plan? I mean, it strikes me there's good plans and there's bad plans, but sometimes the bad plans have something to do with the fact that the idea is too early stage, it's too embryonic, it's not gone through yet. Um, it seems like your presentation speaking to folks who are past bootstrapping, past friends and family, ready to talk to serious investors. You know, maybe their business has matured to a point where They'll have the answers to various points you're talking about. Well, if you have a, you know, assuming we're talking about high impact businesses, so we're talking about businesses that are trying to, you know, become $30 million businesses in five years or bigger. Um, even if you're bootstrapping, I think it's useful to have a plan up front because it'll give you an idea for yourself what the bootstrapping means sure. and when you'll need to raise money and what you think you'll have then. And even then, you can blush test. All right, if I spend this hundred grand of our money and max out all the credit cards, what will I have? And will that be something that can be sold? So I think it's useful, you know, at the point where someone decides to commit. I think part of the thing of have I decided to commit to this project is figuring out is there a plausible business plan that could be built around it. You talked about pricing the deal differently depending on the investor. I'm just wondering what kind of value add should an entrepreneur be looking for out of the investor? Well, good investors, you know, I, I once uh, had a company that was offered 11 million pre by one of the West Coast most, most well-known venture capitalists at the time, and they were holding out for 12 million pre. And if someone had come along and written a 12 million pre who was one of the local funds, and they had taken it, it would have been the stupidest thing they'd ever did in their life. I mean, it was just telling them, this is, you know, X in this deal. The minute they put their name on this deal, you're halfway to having a deal with a, venture, with a banker to take you public. I mean, they have credibility. So well, part of it is just, are they so credible that people, they become sort of what I always used to say was the self-validating financing. You know, if Kleiner Perkins comes into your deal versus Acme Ventures, you know, who's going to, who's, of other funds, which phone call are they going to return? Uh, I once did a deal I was involved with with Soros Capital. The day after Soros Capital put two million bucks in, we had a phone call with the chairman of one of the bulge bracket firms in New York, back when they still existed. Um, so one area is they can come is they can have great financing. They can have great ties in terms of their industry knowledge, of their industry networks for recruiting management. Um, so there's a variety of different value adds. They could have value add in, in terms of business models and putting together financial plans for a company. So there's a lot of different ways um, they can add value. The best firms, the biggest, most well-known firms can add value pretty much across the board, whether it's in terms of industry knowledge, networks for management, financing alternatives, and that sort of thing. And some of them, I think, are just worth, you know, as I say, you can do an IPO sometimes, in a, in a, particularly in a down market or in a market that's not real hot, having the right investor behind the deal can, can often be the difference between getting out the getting out the door and not. Any other questions? It's interesting, Greg, we were talking to a guy on the phone this morning and he got cut off three times and Chad was smart enough to say, I bet you you're on an iPhone. And he, he said, I am. <laughs> <laughs>